Welcome back everybody to um, those of you who have made your way back to here. Um, I hope you enjoyed yourself and, um, and to presenters as well. I hope you're enjoying yourselves. Right now, what I want to do is move to the next part of our program, which is going to be um, our keynote seminar speaker. And the person who will introduce the keynote seminar speaker will be Dr. Su Li Chang. And I just want to quickly um, tell those of you who don't know Dr. Su Li Chang, she is a member of the Department of Biological Sciences. She's also the director of the Institute for Neuroimmune Pharmacology here at Seton Hall. In addition to her classroom instruction and committee service, um, Dr. Chang is heavily active in research. She um, has long-standing funding and a substantial list of publications. Um, among the many roles that Dr. Chang serves at this university, she is a co-chair for the um, Peter Scheim Steering Committee. Um, the Peter Scheim exposition is um, what this biosymposium is a part of. And so year after year, she works very hard to set up a, an excellent program. Um, and this year she has uh, recruited for us our next, um, our speaker. And so I wanna take this moment now to, to acknowledge and to thank Dr. Chang for the work that she's done and for maintaining the communication and recruitment for the speaker that she is now about to introduce. So Dr. Chang, it's yours. Thank you, Dr. To. Um, thank you so much for coming to this uh, um, keynote symposium uh, speaker, uh, the keynote lecture for biosymposium. Uh, as I can tell that our um, biosymposium this year has uh, several unique feature. It uh, is uh, the um, uh, senior biology seminar actually engage their research using the um, higher technology um, uh, basis and then using the IPA, a very powerful uh, bioinformatical tool. I hope you have a chance to visit some of their poster. And then the other unique is our speaker actually is uh, uh, from the other end of the earth. Um, uh, let me tell you, the, um, introduce you, uh, Dr. Um, Chen, Professor Samuel Chen. He is uh, right now, by a crowd, 530 in Taiwan town. Okay. Uh, Professor Samuel Chen received his PhD in physiology from Indiana University many years ago, following postdoctoral training in neurobiology and in Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. He has held academic position at the University of Hong Kong, Indiana University, National Uni University of Singapore, and National Yangming University in Taipei, Taiwan. All this very prominent university. In 1997, Professor Chen was appointed National Chair Professor of Neuroscience, the highest honor um, by the Ministry of Education in Taiwan, and was recruited in 1998 to establish and direct a new center for the neuroscience at the National Sun Yi San uh, University in Kaohsiung, Taiwan. Kaohsiung is the southern part of a big city in Taiwan, where he additionally served as a vice president for academic affairs from uh, 2002 to 2004. He was invited to his current position in 2009 as the inaugurated director and distinguished chair professor of the new state of the arts um, institute of translational research in biomedicine at Changgeng memorial hospital i hope you have chance to see the titiana's uh, description about uh, Changgeng. i will not go into the uh, detail about Changgeng, but take a look at the uh, description about Changgeng. Um, as a chairman of the Medical Research and the Development Board, Changgeng Medical uh, Foundation since 2015, Professor Chen also oversees the planning and the execution of the research activity of the entire Changgeng Memorial Hospital system, made up of six medical um, center with a total 10,000 bed, 3,400 physician, 12,000 paramedical staff and an annual research budget of uh, United, uh, US dollar, 150 million. Changgeng is very much like a um, Gate Foundation, Bill Gate Foundation in US, in Taiwan. 
Uh, Professor Chen is recognized internationally for his distinguished contribution to brain stem cardiovascular reg regulatory function, particularly in translational research on um, brain death and the uh, neurogenic uh, hypertension. He is the recipient of numerous uh, prestigious awards and honors for his uh, research accomplishment, including the Outstanding Commission uh, Research Award, uh, the highest honor conferred by the National Science Council in Taiwan. He was a member of a commission on the uh, Autonomic Nervous System, International Union of uh, Physiological Science, and uh, um, executive committee member of the International Society for Autonomic Neuroscience Research, a member of the Asian Pacific Re Regional Committee, International Brain Research Organization, um, and a member of IBRO Advisory Science Program Committee, council member of the Asian Pacific Society for Neurochemistry, President of the Pharmacology uh, Society in Taiwan, President of Neuroscience Society in Taiwan, President of Asian Pacific uh, Federation of uh, Pharmacologists, Editorial in Chief of the Journal of Biomedical Science. He is currently series um, uh, editor of the monograph series Translational Research in Biomedicine, published by Gagar AB in Sweden and an editor advisor of a biochemical pharmacology. Uh, I met Dr. Chen in 2018 when I served in the National Health Research Institute uh, review, uh, review Committee. And NHRI is just like uh, NIH in USA. And Dr. Chen served uh, that committee for many, many years, uh, bringing in for the, a lot of contribution to the um, biomedical research in Taiwan. Um, without further ado, please join me to invite Dr. Chen for his lecture regarding the, the title here. OK, I let Dr. Chen to introduce his own title then. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Suli Chen. I'm deeply humbled by your very, very kind introduction and wish to thank you again for inviting me to give the keynote seminar at your uh, 2021 Bio Symposium. What I would like to do this morning or this afternoon in your time is to highlight for you the results of roughly 25 years of work done by my associates and myself that led us to the proposal that there exists clinical differential clinical impacts of oxidative stress and nitrosative stress with therapeutic implications. Because of the time limit, I must apologize that I will be using a combination of summary slides and primary data during this talk. I would like to start my talk by giving the audience are uh, two take home image uh, take home messages. The first message pertains to our interpretation of what is disease progression. To my colleagues and myself, a disease will start from physiology and progress to pathophysiology and then to pathology. Now, in terms of therapeutic intervention, Therapeutic intervention is possible against pathophysiology. However, patho, uh, therapeutic intervention is not possible against pathology. Now, our work indicates that the progression from physiology to pathophysiology actually involves oxidative stress, and pathophysiology to pathology will involve nitrosative stress. So that's the, my first take home message. My second take home message concerns a common drawback in contemporary biomedicine, 
which has the inclination to create a stereotypic generalization on an identified physiological phenomenon or cellular mechanism, but and inadvertently assumes its universal application. My very, very case in point is the topic of my talk today, and it concerns uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. As an individual, reactive indiv oxygen species actually contains many, many molecules, but the, for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to concentrate on the, one of the most popular uh, reactive oxygen species, and that is superoxide. On the other hand, reactive nitrogen species would contain primarily nitric oxide, and when nitric oxide interacts with superoxide, it becomes a very, very toxic substance known as peroxide nitrate. So I can, as you can see, these are individual molecules. But over the years, particularly during the last two decades, the uh, message has uh, been missed. And people often forgot that oxidative stress and nitrosity stress, basically in biological terms, it would indicate an imbalance between pr production and the elimination either of RS or RNS. But during the last decade, there are some problems because oxidative stress has been such an important and so often mentioned term, particularly when antioxidant has gradually become the magic bullet to a lot of people, meaning that people believe that antioxidant would actually do everything for everything and it is becoming a billion dollar business, then there's a misconception that comes along and that is oxidative stress and nitrosative stress are actually common culprits for cellular damage. And if you read the literature, an impression of RRS slash RNS often appear in published journals, suggesting to many people that RRS and RNS are actually a singular moiety, and usually the, that representation is a surrogate for our ROS. To me, this generalized assumption, assumption would require modification. So this is actually the, the thrust of my talk for uh, this more this afternoon. And using as my example, is actually a very, very simple reflex that is happening in everybody's body a reflex which is known as barrel reflex. A barrel reflex is a basic response of the body, for instance, when for any particular reason, uh, there is an increase in arterial pressure, then the arterial barrel receptors would receive that information and beginning uh, an increase in this firing rate. And this information is gonna go back to the medulla oblongata into something what the textbooks would call cardiovascular center, and from there, the, sympath the sympathetic outflow to the heart would decrease, the sympathetic, the vagal outflow to the heart would increase, and together, the heart rate was, would drop. And at the same time, the sympathetic outflow to the blood vessels would decrease, and then the resistance to flow would decrease, and, and the overall result is the blood pressure would go back to normal. So this is a classic barrel reflex response to hypertension. And the opposite is true when the blood pressure drops. So for, to you and to me, the barrel reflex is, has a basic function for the maintenance of stable blood pressure and heart rate. A typical example is for you in the morning, if you wake up very quickly, you're already late for work, and then you, you sit up very quickly and feel a little bit giddy, and then you shake your head and everything is okay. And that is because your barrel reflex is functioning. However, for a particular reason, when the barrel reflex is dysfunction, then there's several things that can happen. It can go from orthostatic hypotension, which is a very common side effect of many drugs, and the person would feel dizzy, lightheadedness, but then when, when the condition progresses to acute orthostatic intolerance, and finally to chronic orthostatic intolerance, 
the patient will essentially cannot sit up. They have to lie down all the time. So, and that is because, because the barrel reflex is not functioning correctly. Now, for the, for the illustration of this particular aspect, I'm going to use one example, uh, an example of a case known as neurogenic hypertension to illustrate for you what uh, this function of barrel reflex means. Now, to, not too many people are aware that when the barrel reflex is defunct, meaning that it's no more functional, it actually would uh, lead the person to, to exhibit brain death, which means uh, defunct barrel reflex can be fatal. Now, if you read a textbook, this is a classical a circuit for the barrel reflex functions. Barrel reflex is actually made up of two particular arms. Now, when the barrel receptor uh, receives this information from the uh, blood vessels, it would go, go back to the brainstem to, uh, and make its termination at the nucleus known as nucleus tractus solitarii, which you're going to see many, many times from this point on, known as NTS. And this information is going to branch into two branches. One branch would go from the NTS to a uh, particular nucleus known as nucleus ambiguous. And nucleus ambiguous is actually the cells of origin of the vagus nerve. So from nucleus ambiguous, the vagus nerve is going to send the information to the heart. And this reflex is known as cardiac vagal barrel reflex. So for the purpose of this talk, cardiac vagal barrel barrel reflex is actually the, the arm of the barrel reflex that controls the heart. Now, from the NTS, it can also go another way, and it can go to another area known as the retroventrolateral medulla, or RVLM. And from there, RVLM will send its impulses to the sympathetic preganglionic neurons in the spinal cord, and from there, the information is going to go to the vessels. So this so this reflex is known as the barrel reflex mediated sympathetic vasomotor tone. So for the, for the purpose of this talk, the barrel reflex mediated sympathetic vasomotor tone is the arm that controls the blood vessels. So with this particular background, let me start to tell you a story that allows us to uh, conclude that there are differential roles of oxidative stress and nitrosity stress and let me start by looking at the output side of the barrel reflex on the sympathetic vasomotor tone. So I'm going to use the two examples, the neurogenic hypertension, meaning that the barrel reflex is dysfunction, and brain death, meaning that the barrel reflex is now defunct. Now, the origin of the sympathetic vasomotor tone, if you remember, starts from the area known as the retroventral lateral medulla, the ventral lateral medulla is actually a very small area in the brain. In the red, this area is roughly about 600 micrometers times 600 micrometers. So it's a very, very small, but our group is able to perform many, many biochemical studies based on this particular, particular area. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of what happens in the RVOM during the situation uh, and the, how the uh, Oxidative stress and nitrosative stress will affect it. So again, going back to my first example, neurogenic hypertension. Now, neurogenic hypertension clinically is defined as hypertension that is not due to defects of the peripheral organs or the blood vessels. In, in, in other words, hypertension actually starts from the brain. So let me give you an example of a typical animal model of neurogenic hypertension, which is known as spontaneously hypertensive rats. Uh, these rats ha has a very, very interesting uh, phenotype, and that is when the, when the uh, rats are actually growing up about eight weeks after uh, maturation, uh, about eight weeks, the blood pressure of these rats would spontaneously increase and become hypertensive at around so 12 weeks. So we, if we take a, a red a SHR and look at this RVLM and, and, and look at the marker of the ROS, you can see that there's a lot of uh, 
inf uh, increased in ROS than compared to its control uh, animal. So suggesting that there, in the SHR that there is an elevated production, in this case of superoxide uh, in the uh, VOM, as you can see in a summary slide. So we have, we actually received this observation ooh, roughly uh, in, in, in the earlier 2000, uh, uh, well, earlier this century. Now, to take a very, very long series of this, which actually spans about seven years, I'm going to go, only give you two summary slides of what our group has found. First of all, the increase in superoxide can come from uh, this function in the mitochondria. As you recall, mitochondria would have uh, a very important process known as ele electron transfer, which allows the production of ATP. But when some of these enzymes are involved in that process is not functionally right, then superoxide is going to, to, be to be produced by the mitochondria. At the same time, there's an enzyme known as NADPH oxidase. When this becomes active, then superoxide is also going to increase. So basically, when the production of superoxide is increased, or when the uh, elimination of superoxide, in this case, superoxide, uh, this mutase, is not functioning, then both the increase in production and decrease in elimination is going to generate uh, oxidative stress in the RVOM, and then, of course, that leads to hypertension. So it doesn't matter whether there's an increase in the, uh, uh, in the uh, NAD oxidative oxidative activity, uh, decrease in the mitochondrial electronic uh, transfer frame, uh, transfer chain, we are going to see an uh, increase in superoxide in the RVOM. But interestingly, the increase in superoxide can actually produce two kinds of effects. It can actually work on another enzyme known as P40A MAC kinase, which actually is going to stimulate the production of glutamate receptors. And when that happens, we're going to see a short-term hypertension that is happening in the animal. But the superoxide that is being produced also goes through another, another enzyme, which is known as is the ERP kinase enzyme. And that is going to go through a long series of transcription and translation, which ends up with the uh, increase in the a receptor known as the angiotensin 81 receptor. And that is going to uh, result in long-term hyper hypertension. So as you can see on the lower uh, left corner, uh, these are the work that actually uh, span over about seven years that leads us to this particular conclusion. Now, let me turn uh, the coin to take a look at what are the uh, contributions of uh, nitrosative stress uh, on the on sympathetic vasomotor Everybody in the audience must be aware of this particular uh, uh, molecule known as nitric oxide, which becomes very famous when in 1992, the journal Science uh, actually uh, considered it the molecule of the year. And then followed by 1998, the three scientists received a Nobel Prize for their work on nitric oxide. And nitric oxide all of, all of a sudden becomes a very, very hot topic in biomedicine. Now, our textbook information tells us that there are actually at least three forms of uh, uh, nitric oxide synthase, uh, NOS1, or neuronal NOS, and NOS3, or endothelial NOS, are uh, actually considered what is known as a conservative, a, a uh, endogenous uh, nitric oxide, that, which means that it is a constitutively present in the cell all the time. NOS2, or the, as the name implies, inducible NOS, is thought originally as not present uh, in a normal situation, but it will only be, has to be induced. Uh, but in, 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 in somewhere around 19, uh, the late 1990s, we found something very interesting that is happening in the RVOM. And that is all three NOS isoforms, including the NOS1, NOS2, are 
And NOS2, and NOS2, which normally is thought to be only present when it's being induced, is present in normal confusiological situation, either in the form of RNA and in, in, form of, in the form of protein. Now, this is a very, very interesting observation. Uh, and then further study uh, allows us to actually confirm that this is, this is actually a very uh, unique situation. If we perform a, a proteomics uh, study and look at the proteome of the RVLM, as you can see, that it is also present NOS1, NOS2, and NOS3, particularly NOS2 is present in the proteome or the, or the protein profile of RVLM. If you do a staining, then we can see that NOS1 and NOS2 are also present in the cells of the RVLM, but not NOS3, which is only present in the endothelium, as the name implies. So just suggesting that physiologically, NOS1 and NOS2 are actually playing a physiological role in the, in the RVLM. Now, in a series of pharmacological study, we further uh, reviewed that nitric oxide that is being produced by NOS1 is actually increasing sympathetic vasomototone, whereas nitric oxide produced by NOS2 it is going to decrease in sympathetic vasomototone. Now, you would, you would wonder, how can the cell differentiate where, whether the NO is produced from NOS1 or NOS2? And then we, uh, subsequent studies actually said that the, the difference is in the concentration of NO that is being produced. NO that is being produced by NOS has, is about 1,000-fold more than the NO that is being produced by NOS1. In addition, the signaling trend, uh, pathway uh, the following the uh, action of NO on the RVRM neuron is very, very different. NO, NOS, NO from NOS1 is actually going through the classic uh, pathway of NO, the soluble guanidase cyclase, like the AMP and, and protein kinase G pathway, whereas NO being produced by NOS2 is actually going through the combination, the interaction with superoxide and, and to, towards the formation of the toxic substance known as peroxide nitrate. So you will wonder then, uh, with this differential role of the uh, NOS1 and NOS2 in the LVOM, would it ha affect uh, high blood pressure? So, so of course, then we'll take a look again with using the animal of SHR and found something very, very different, very interesting. And that is on the basal level, and this is on the messenger RNA level, uh, the uh, NOS1, the NOS2 message RNA in the RVRM in the SHR is actually less than the normal. And if we in, if we excite these cells with a, a endotoxin like lipopolysaccharide, then you can find the response is also uh, less in the SHR, suggesting that there is a reduced NOS2 message RNA in the RVRM of the SHR. At the same time, the same thing is happening in the, at the protein level. Now, this is very, very interesting, but we have to confirm whether that is a simply a biologic, a biochemical artifact. So what we did is we actually purposely reduced the blood pressure of the SHR by using a, a typical antihypertensive known as captopril, and we bring back the uh, blood pressure of the SHR into normal, and then take a look at the at the study, and then found that what happens? There's nothing happened at the left. The same thing is actually the NO, the NOS2 is actually decreasing at the basal level, and it actually it, the response to uh, endotoxin is actually less. Nothing happens at the level of messenger RNA at the level of protein. And most importantly, we actually look at the same thing with pre-hypertensive SHR, with, which means that we actually take the SHR at about week four weeks where the blood pressure has not increased and did the same uh, situation. If you look at the uh, NOS2 level at message RNA at, at protein level, as you can see, again, they are all reduced. So this is a very interesting because everybody was actually looking at the function of how oxidative stress is affecting blood pressure. 
And this is actually the, one of the very first studies that shows that nit nitrosity stress is also happening here. So for this part of the, the study, the uh, a summary is that during neurogenic hypertension, oxidative stress actually underpins the increase in sympathetic vasomotor tone by acting on the RVLM. But it, uh, the very, very in, important thing is that the molecular synthesis and the functional of expression of NOS2 in the RVLM is reduced. And this down regulation of both base of NOS2 in the RVLM is innate. Everybody thought that nitrosity uh, stress is bad. But in this particular case, if you can agree with me, the, the NOS2 actually is actually uh, performing uh, the, the role of a good guy. It is actually holding back the uh, oxidative stress that is going to increase in sympathetic vasobotone. Now, uh, if you want to, to uh, uh, see the detailed uh, signaling pathway, uh, uh, please refer to one of the reviews that we, we wrote uh, in 2009, and this is a summary of a very, very complicated situation. Now, let me take, take, take another look at the differential role of the oxidative stress and nitrosative stress on the sympathetic vasomotor tone uh, from the angle of brain depth. Exactly almost like 25 years ago, we, uh, we had a very, very uh, unexpected finding from our patients. And this is the, at, a, at a time when we actually perform a technique known as power spectral analysis of the blood pressure. And we found that at the lower uh, frequency spectrum of the blood pressure, uh, like in a normal healthy volunteer, this is a very, very strong signal that is happening here. And then in the, this unexpected finding is this signal is actually uh, representing life and death. So we have in our hands in, in, in something around 1997, uh, a handle that is actually look at life and death of a patient. And if we look at a patient, that has been confirmed to exhibit the brain death by the neurologist. Take a look at here that the, this particular signal is gone. So in fact, in, in, in our experience and the patient, when this signal is gone from the patients, that this patient is going to, uh, is not able to survive because when this is happening, brain death is, is actually happening and brain death clinically is irreversible. So shortly after the ex exhibition of the loss of this signal, this heart asystole, the heart is going to stop and this person would, would die, unfortunately. So, so with this particular information, then when we actually undertook a long, long series of study that would allow us to uh, explore the mystery of brain depth. Now, if you remember our good friend, the RVLM, which I said a while ago is uh, re, uh, responsible for the elicitation of the sympathetic phase of the tone. And, and shortly after our clinical observation, we found that the RVRM is also the origin of this life and death signal. So, so then uh, uh, we started a long program and after about uh, 20 some years, we're able to uh, find uh, identify a lot of programs that are happening at the level of the cellular level and um, at the level of the molecular level uh, in the RVRM. And we found that there are actually two, pro two programs. One is actually trying to make the animal to survive, which we call pro-life programs. And one which is going to lead the animal to die, which was, we call pro-death programs. So of course, uh, uh, we, we have in our hands that in the RVLM, the NOS1 and NOS2 are present. So here is a, a very, very typical example. In, in fact, this is the very first uh, data that we got from a study on the mechanism of brainstem. If you look at the, from, from life to death, the, the amount of, met, of the uh, NOS2 is going to increase tremendously. And then if you look at the NOS1 signal, this is actually not changed too much. So suggesting to us that NOS2 is actually playing a very, very important role uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in terms of the progression towards uh, brain death, although NOS1 is also present. 
uh, has played a role. Now, again, please remember uh, that NOS1, uh, the NO produced by NOS1, uh, we found that it, it actually is increasing the life and death signal, and the nitric oxide that's being produced by NOS2 is decreasing the life and death signal, meaning it's going to lead uh, the animal towards brain death. And please remember that the, 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 the signaling from NOS1 and NOS2 are very, very different, particularly for NOS2, uh, the signal is peroxide nitrate. So let me summarize for you uh, a, 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 uh, the results of roughly about 25 years. And we, we see that from the, pro the progression from life to death actually is going through a pro-life phase where the animal is trying to, to make itself survive. And then when it is not happening, then we go to a pro-death phase. So that the primary uh, molecule that is responsible for the pro-life phase is actually our good friend here, the good uh, NOS1, which produces nano, which goes through the soluble guanine cyclase PKG system, which then is, is going to make the uh, a sympathetic vasomotor tone increase and therefore increase the blood pressure and make the animal to uh, and, and, and allow the animal to survive. But when this is happening, and shortly after that, uh, off, then we're going to have to see the activation of NOS2. And when NOS2 is happening, remember, the, NOS, the nitric oxide that it's going to produce is going to increase tremendously. And when it combines with superoxide, it actually comes up with the peroxide nitrate. And of course, the origin of the superoxide is, is from the mitochondrial dysfunction or from the activation of NADPH oxidase. Now this is, uh, but then subsequently we found that this, the activation of NOS1 and NOS2 are actually subjected to many regulations. It's subjected to transcriptional and translational re regulation. For instance, activation of NOS2 requires the activation of the transcription factor NF kappa B and NF kappa B is actually subjected to other regulations, uh, which is interestingly the cancer signals, the PI3 kinase and the AKT, which are classic uh, uh, signals that are involved in cancer genesis, is happening uh, in this particular case. Likewise, NOS1 is also subjected to the regulation of another transcription factor known as HIF1 alpha hypoxia inducible factor. And then, and then this is this, the situation is, is a long series, and it actually starts from hypoxia to HIF1 alpha to heme oxygenase 1 to heat sharp protein 70, which then is going to activate NOS1. So it's a very, very complicated situation. Uh, and of course, uh, we can act, we also have the uh, system that is going to be on the pro life side, it is anti uh, apoptosis, and on the Pro-death side is actually back system, which leads to a apoptosis. Now, during the process of progression towards brain death, we also have a, a large number of post-translational uh, uh, regu regulations. And for instance, we know that the uh, one of the systems that are, is responsible for the, for the degradation of, of proteins in the, in the body, the ubiquitin protein system, is actually involved here. And also uh, it, it involved in the regulation of NF kappa B and in the regulation of NOS2. And another system is cousin SUMO system is also involved in the regulation of HIF1 alpha. So to, to put a very long story short, it, it's just simply telling uh, you that there is a very complicated system. Life and death is such an important uh, uh, such important to the survival of the, of the being. So therefore, it is a very, very important system that is actually regulating here. And, but, but to put it simply, that the, in, in, in terms of the uh, regulation of sympath uh, sympathetic vasomotor tone, the, the primary uh, action is the augmentation of NOS1 expression, which then leads to the upregulation of peroxide nitrite in the RVLM. So nitrosative stress actually underpins the decrease in the sympathetic vasomotor tone, uh, and that leads to the death of the animal. Now, I did not have time to tell you the role of oxidative stress in this particular case, 
But just to, to, to tell you to complete the story, let me tell you that oxidative stress in, in the case of brain stem in the RVM is actually pro-life. So that is actually another example to tell you that oxidative stress is not always bad. So again, if you're in interested into the details of the signaling uh, uh, pathway uh, in the RVM that is related to brain death, please uh, read up the, uh, after the review article in pharmacology and therapy. So in this part of the, of the talk, uh, what I'm trying to give you is that some of the examples that shows that there is indeed uh, a differential role of oxidative stress and nitrosative in the RVM uh, based on our study on neurogenic hypertension and brain death, and then they do have a differential role on the sympathetic vasomotor tone. So that is the output side of the barrel reflex. Now, let me go back now and, and complete the circle and look at the entire barrel reflex loop. If you recall a, a while ago uh, in the circuit, uh, the barrel reflex is actually com compared, com comprised of two uh, arms. From the NTS, it will stimulate the nucleus uh, ambiguous, which is uh, sending the vagal nerve to the heart that it in inhibits the heart. And from the NTS, uh, it's, it, it's the other way around. It actually inhibits the RVLM, which is exciting the sympathetic uh, preganglionic neurons and goes to the vessel. Now, this particular circuit has appeared in all the textbooks since the 1990s. And every student studying barrel reset would memorize this circuit. But the interesting thing is, until 10 years ago, the existence of these circles has never been visualized. It is always indirect evidence. So about 10 years ago, uh, there's a new technology that comes around, and that it is a technology, uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, and one particular uh, uh, tool that is known as diffusion tensor imaging, they will allow tractographic analysis, and basically it is allowing to the analysis of functional connectivity between brain nuclei. My, my institute acquired a animal uh, MRI in early in, 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 in somewhere around the uh, uh, about ten years ago, and and then so. Very excitedly, we, we, we start this, okay, now we have a, a MRI and it's supposed to be able to do tractographic analysis. So let's go back and take a look at whether the neural circuit for the barrel reflex actually exists. So but when we look at the literature, we found that the application of diffusion tensor imaging uh, at that time is about 10 years ago, it all, uh, involved in the study of the forebrain. Very, very little or next to nothing is, a, is being published in terms of diffusion tensor imaging of the brainstem. So very naively, we're very, very happy that, okay, here is a, is a, a virgin area for study. So let's, let's go ahead and look at brainstem without knowing that there is a tremendous difficulty in, in, in performing diffusion tensor imaging in the brainstem. For one thing, the size of the brainstem is very, very small. But it actually, so with a dedication of my team, we, we actually spent a good part of two years. We're able now to, to perform DTI sequence, not even on a red, but on the, on the mouse medulla oblongata. And we can actually perform a analysis of roughly two mm uh, in the brainstem where the neural barrel reflex neural circuit is, the, is is happening, and we can actually perform uh, a, a uh, dissection of roughly about two two thousand uh, two hundred micrometers. So here is the first example that we say when we actually look at, for instance, the connection with the NTS and the nucleus ambiguous. And this, and we found that there's actually a very, very prominent signal that is being able, uh, that, that is actually uh, occurring between the NTS and, 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 and NA. So, so we start our work at about 
uh, 2000. And then after two years, we were able to uh, find this signal. And finally, we had, uh, we we're very glad that we convinced the editors of Neural Image, which is the classic image journal, that this signal is really existing. So with this capability in our hands, then we're able to go back and perform tractographic analysis on the functional connectivity between the brain stem nuclei and the baron reflex uh, nucleus, uh, neural circuit. And, uh, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time uh, on this part because I think this is something that is very, very new and it might be of interest to the audience. So again, now let me use this tool to look at the differential role of oxidative stress and nitrosative stress in barrel reflex dysregulation now. And again, using our two uh, examples, neurogenic hypertension, which is pathophysiology, and brain death, which is pathology. Okay, let me take a look at neurogenic hypertension first. As I mentioned a while ago, neurogenic hypertension is hypertension that is not due to defects of peripheral organ or blood vessel. And the culprit is actually depressed barrel reflex. So the reason why the animal can have high blood pressure or the person can have high blood pressure is because the barrel reflex is not functioning well. So when the blood pressure goes, goes up, then it would not go back down. So, so depressed barrel reflex is a hallmark for neurogenic hypertension. If you look at the literature, we already know that the oxidative stress in the brain underlies neurogenic hypertension. And, and one of the reasons is that there's an increase in a, a, a hormone called nandiotensin II, uh, and, and, and particularly when angiotensin II works on the NTS, it would induce oxidative stress, and that angiotensin uh, II would depress barrel reflex. So these are all liter uh, information from various publications in the literature. So about 10 years ago, when we looked at the whole picture, we found one thing that nobody has ever put all these together uh, to, uh, to uh, confirm that there's a cause causative relation uh, between all these. So, so then we, 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 st we start a study uh, under the guiding hypothesis that oxidative stress in the, induced by angiotensin II at the NTS would participate in the generation of neurogenic hypertension via the depression of barrel reflex. Now, because of the time limit, I'm going to use one example, one arm of the cardiovascular barrel reflex uh, to illustrate this set of study. Now, this is a very, very tedious study. Uh, we actually employ a technique known as radio, tele uh, radio telemetry, which would allow us to record uh, blood pressure changes uh, of the animal under a conscious state in, in the animal's home cage. But for that, we have to implant a sensor uh, into the animal. So about 17 days before the actual experiment, we perform surgery. Uh, we cannulate the aorta, put in a sensor in the animal, and allow it to recover for two weeks. And, and, and then start uh, recording our basal uh, activity uh, uh, by radio telemetry. So this is a, uh, a very, very good technique that allow us to actually perform our studies when the animal is not under uh, anesthesia. So on the day of the experiment, what we did is we actually put the animal under surgery again. And in this case, we implant a, something what is known as osmotic mini pump, which is a, a, a which allow us to infuse angiotensin into the cerebral ventricles of animal at a steady rate over, over many, many days. And then uh, we can follow many, many changes over from one week to seven weeks. But before that, because we, since we have the MRI, as soon as we implant the cannula, we can actually put the animal under the ML, MRI and very, very confirm that this cannula is actually uh, actually connected to the ventricle here. So this is a, 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 an edge over many studies because if you don't have this technique, then you have to wait until the end of the experiment and then find out that the cannula does not reach the cannula and then the whole experiment is, is forfeited. 
So with that, then I'm going to give, give you an example of infusion of angiotensin for uh, seven days. And you can see that we have an increase in systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, which would, when this end, uh, when the perfusion ends, it actually takes seven days to come back to normal. So by, set, by day 14, uh, the, the blood pressure is going back to normal. If you look at the barrel reflex, of course, the classic example of neurogenic hypertension, the barrel reflex is actually uh, reduced. And for, for because of that, then the inhibition of the heart is released. Then we actually have the increase in heart rate. Very classic uh, neurogenic hypertension model. Now, the assumption then, that is when, when this is happening, we, we, we are pre predict that the connection between the NTS and the nucleus ambiguous has been dis disrupted. So this is, for us, it's very easy. Then we, if we put the animal under the MRI and we actually put the animal under MRI at seven time points before the blood pressure, when blood pressure goes down, when it goes back to normal, and we actually take a look at the, uh, at the level of the same animal over time. And this is the, the, the beauty of this study. So here's an example of what happens. Before the experiment, you remember there's a nice connection between the NTS and the NA. So on day two, when the blood pressure starts to drop, you can see the connection is, is beginning to decrease. It is decreased again. But the most inter interesting thing that we found is when the blood pressure goes back to normal, for instance, at day 21, this connection is re-established. And this is a very, very surprising finding to me, suggesting that this is not a morphological signal, but it is a physiological signal. So if you, if you have to uh, use all the analysis of, uh, of indexes of, uh, of connectivity, this is the whole thing. When the blood pressure is down, the, uh, when the barrel reflex is inhibited, this is decreasing. Now, what does it mean? So it took us a while to figure out what that means, but let me give you, I'll take you through uh, our reasoning. Before, uh, in, in an angiotensin infusion study, uh, animal and its control, the, the conductivity is here in a normal situation. And we interpreted that this connection is a represented a connection from NTS that is stimulate the nucleus ambiguous which is inhibiting the heart. And this is a classic physiology known as vagal break to the heart. The vagus is stepping, is actually slowing down the heart. So, but this is a tonically active, active. So this is actually representing a tonically active barrel reflex mediated vagal break to the heart. So let's take a look at day two when the barrel reflex is, is, re, uh, is reduced. On the control, of course, nothing happens, but as you recall, the connectivity here is decreasing. So what does it mean? So if you look at this, this means that when this excitation of NTS and NA is decreasing, then the excitation of NA, the inhibition of the nucleus ambiguous to the, to the heart, which is the vagal break, is now being released. So in other words, the, uh, the inhibition of NA to the heart is now decreasing, and for that reason, the heart rate is going to increase. So the thing goes back you know, all, the, all the way to day seven and, and so forth. So this is very, very, very interesting, but we want to know whether uh, the angiotensin system is involved and whether oxidative stress is involved. So we did a very, very expensive experiment, and I'll, I'll explain to you why it's expensive. We, we again performed the radio, uh, the tele, uh, radio telemetry recording uh, and, and start recording our control three days be before. But on the day of experiment, we implant the osmotic mini pump uh, infusing angiotensin. But we only uh, observed the result of this over four hours. And that is because we have to Additionally, we have to do micro injection of blood drops into the NTS to see what happens. And I mentioned that this is very expensive because the system, the moment you operate an M, M, uh, each time we, we uh, perform an MRI scanning, uh, we are charged 400 US dollars. 
Uh, whereas before we can actually uh, perform the same study over weeks, uh, days and weeks. Uh, but this is very, very uh, uh, well spent uh, uh, $400, and I'll tell you why. So we can then take four hours later, we can actually look at the study, or MRI study, and we can actually perform biochemical analysis. So here, let me tell you the biochemical studies first. So superoxide in the NTS is increasing. We've already know that. And we actually know uh, by a study, uh, some biochemical analysis, we know that the origin of this superoxide is N actually NADPH oxidase. And then we have to confirm that this has, this has to, to be uh, related to oxidative stress. So we actually perform a microinjection of a drug, a tampo, which is an antioxidant or apocyline, which is an NADPH oxidase inhibitor into directly into NTS and lock it again. And as you can see, treatment with tampo and apocyline will reduce the increase in superoxide. And then we can we confirm that this uh, increase in superoxide is because of action of angiotensin on AT1 receptor because it is blocked by the angiotensin A1 receptor losartan, but not by the angiotensin 2 receptor PD compound, either on the superoxide side or on the activation of ND, NADPH oxidase. So what happens with our uh, with our uh, MRI studies, and this is a series. If you call uh, uh, at four hours after uh, the infusion of angiotensin two, we already see that the disc, that the connectivity here is decreasing. Now, if we treat the animal by injecting NTS on uh, losartan, the AT1 receptor antagonist into NTN, this connectivity actually is returning, but not with the AT2 receptor antagonist. And this signal would also return on microinjection of an antioxidant or an NADPH oxidase inhibitor into the NTS. So this is a very interesting study, and we actually perform classic pharmacology using a modern technique of MRI. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the most important study in this case is that when we inject a blocker of nitrosative stress, this is the, actually a a block of a peroxide nitride into the NTS, this signal does not come back. So it's suggesting in this case that nitrosative, nitrosative stress has played no role in this particular situation. So the conclusion on this particular part is, is that the, on the, during neurogenic hypertension, the angiotensin will work through AT1 receptor at the NTS and produce oxidative stress into this area and that disrupts the connection between NTS to ambiguous, which then is gonna, uh, at the end, uh, depress the barrel reflex. But the most important message that I want to convey to you is that the disrupted in connectivity induced by oxidative stress is reversible. So pathophysiology, oxidative stress, reversible. So now, let me, uh, let me uh, turn uh, the coin to take a look at another model that we use for, for brain death. And this is a model known as hepatic encephalopathy. And this is a common, uh, uh, most common patient uh, seen in patients with advanced uh, liver cirrhosis. But the indication is, is not so good, but the, if the patient does not receive liver transplantation, that the death rate is about 50 to 90%. So, but nobody knows right. So, so we already picked up this, this project about seven years, seven, eight years uh, ago. And, and, then, and then we actually relate this, uh, uh, we, we actually relate this, this with our uh, observation 25 years ago. Remember the life and death signal. And this life and death signal that is actually are represented by the barrel reflex mediated sympathetic vasomotor tone. And, and please recall that when this is, the signal is gone, then the, the patient is going to die because brain death is irreversible. So when we look at hepatic encephalopathy, we found that uh, 
patients with this particular disease will exhibit reduced barrel reflex sensitivity and re reduce our uh, indexes of barrel reflex. And then when we relate it to the loss of barrel reflex mediated sympathetic vasal uh, tone in brain death patients, and we put it one and one together, we come up with a hypothesis that the defunct barrel reflex mediated sympathetic vasal tone is actually underlying the high mortality. So here is a typical example. We use a compound known as thioacetamide, and we actually perform three daily injections, and in this case, in the red. And we found that over time, that there would be increase in the liver uh, indexes of liver dysfunction and increase in ammonia, which is basically what is causing uh, uh, hepatic encephalopathy. So, and you look at the liver, and the liver over is the dose response curve that the liver is actually uh, has increasing liver damage as demonstrated by the, the blue dots, which is a necrosis, and then the infiltration of, of, of neutrophil. The mortality is actually increased dose responsibly, but the and then, then with the uh, clinical grading of the as hepatic encephalopathy. The, the gradient numbers will actually increase over time. So, so this is a very, very typical animal model of hepatic encephalopathy. But let me give you a real life data of what happens to the animal uh, over time when we inject the animal. Now, if you look at the activity of the animal by about day two, the activity of the animal is begin, beginning to drop and drop and drop and actually uh, come to a standstill at about day four. You look at the blood pressure, very interestingly, blood pressure remains fairly stable over three days, but it is only beginning to decline a little bit on day four and then roughly uh, uh, end at the end. And you just uh, pay attention to this very 90 degree drop. Look, you look at the heart rate, the heart rate is basically in maintained is at the very, very end then it is the suddenly stops. Look at the barrel reflex mediated vasomotor tone. It actually increases at, at the beginning, and this is pro-life. And then it's only twice around here when the barrel reflex mediated vasomotor tone is decreasing. And you recall, you go back to our patients, and this is at a time when the blood pressure is still good, when this signal is gone, if you, it's a patient that the blood uh, brain death is already ensuing. You look at the cardiovascular barrel reflex, it, it, it actually is in, increasing a little bit, and then it's, it, it actually remains over the home course until at the very end when it suddenly drops. And the, when it drops, the heart rate drops. We, have, we go from brain death to cardiac uh, death. So this is a very nice uh, model of, uh, of, of, of brain death. So again, we actually took take an MI scanning at very different time points. Uh, at the uh, of the animal, and here is just want to show you uh, one example of what happens to the barrel reflex mediated sympathetic phasal motor tone. At day one, if you recall, the barrel reflex actually is increasing, and you, if you recall that, but the, if you look at the signal, the signal is actually decreasing a little bit. So if you recall, this this signal is actually an inhibitory signal from NTS to the RVLM. So when this signal is decreasing, then this is actually a rebound that the signal is increasing. So, so it's actually demonstrated by the RVLM. So, but then, then over time, this signal is gradually decreasing. On day two, still a little bit here, a little bit here. On day three, still a little bit here. But on day four, this signal is completely gone. Remember, the animal actually goes into brain death around this point. So, so this situation is that the animal goes from dysfunction to defunct barrel reflex mediated sympathetic vasomotor tone. So because of the time, I'm going to skip these slides, but it's just to show you the, some of the our biochemical study. We, we subsequently confirmed that all these changes are actually due to augmented peroxynitrite in the NTS or in the RVLM. And here is an example that will actually uh, test our tissues uh, from the NTS on the NR using electrospin resonance measurement. And we see that there is an increase in the uh, in peroxynitrate. And if you block the, uh, 
the, the system uh, with uh, with a blocker of peroxide nitrite, it does not affect the increase in nitrate uh, NOS2 in either the NTS or the RVM, but then it would block the signal in the, uh, uh, it would block the signal, uh, the peroxide nitrite uh, signal in the uh, NTS and the RVM, and suggesting that the augmented per, uh, peroxide nitrite is actually the culprit. Now let's take a look at the MRI data again. Uh, so here is a situation of the, the, the connection between the NTS and the NA is, is actually remaining just a little bit. But if we inject, uh, if we block peroxide nitride in the NTS beforehand, then we found that this signal is actually in, uh, uh, remaining. So it's actually, it's, it's actually it can uh, suggest that the nitrosity stress is actually causing it. So the same thing is happening within the uh, uh, connection with NTS and the RVM from nothing and treatment uh, by blocking the peroxide nitride is going to re, uh, uh, reverse the situation. And study is that nitrosis is nitrosity of stress in NTS in the RVOM is actually uh, causing the disruption of the signal and then the, 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 the disappearance of the barrel reflex mediated sympathetic vasomotor tone is actually causing uh, the animal to go into brain death. So the message that I would like to convey to you is that the mortality from um, animal model of brain death is that the, there is a irreversible disruption of the connectivity uh, in the uh, barrel reflex uh, circuit, which is being induced by nitrosative st uh, stress in NTS uh, that is actually uh, responsible for the uh, observed uh, uh, process in during brain death. So again, if we now look at the uh, based on the disruption of the functional connectivity between the key substrates in the barrel reflex circuit, and we look at the impact of oxidative stress and nitrosative stress on brain uh, barrel reflex dysregulation. Now, the message is if this disruption is re reversible, then we are actually looking at pathophysiology. And this pathophysiology, if you call, is being caused by oxidative stress. And when oxidative stress is happening, we are able to uh, use blockers to reverse the situation, and meaning that we can actually reverse oxidative stress. And, and the situation is that uh, the animal or the, the, the by, by implication, the patient is amenable to remedy. However, if the disruption is irreversible, then we are going from pathophysiology to pathology. And this pathology is related to the uh, occurrence of nitros nitrosative stress, and this is fatal. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, the conclusion of this talk is that uh, our interpretation of this decreased progression would go uh, uh, will allow us to say that therapeutic intervention is, uh, is, is able to reverse the situation of pathophysiology and pathophysiology from physiology to pathophysiology in this talk is actually being caused by oxidative stress. But when this situation is moved from to nitros nitrosative stress, then the situation is, is actually becoming uh, irreversible and that the uh, therapeutic invent, inter, intervention is usually not possible. So I would like to acknowledge the uh, fundings from uh, uh, various organizations and uh, I'm very privileged to uh, receive uh, uh, sufficient fundings all, all over the last 25 years that will allow us to do uh, many interesting work and uh, particularly I would like to acknowledge the Ministry of Science and Technology the Ministry of Education, and of course, my mother foundation, the Changgang Medical Foundation for funding uh, this, this study. Um, I would like to end this uh, uh, talk by uh, offering the students in the audience a message from a very, very senior uh, investigator. The message is, is something like this. Research is like climbing the Great Wall of China. 
It is an uphill battle. It requires effort and it is exhausting. However, when you reach the top and you look down, it is invigorating and self-fulfilling. So think about these two slides when you face difficulties during your research now or in, your, in the future, because research is what makes uh, us, makes the society grow and what makes us uh, to become a better person. And I'm very glad that I, for the last 40 years, I've been climbing the Great Wall with the company of one person, uh, my wife, Professor Julie Chen. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much to uh, Professor Chen. Um, such informative information, such a philosophical study in the research, turn around and then the between life and death. So um, with this, I would like to see if any student uh, faculty has question to uh, Professor Chen about the presentation. Um, well, with that, um, I like to know that uh, when you do the animal MRI study, are the animal being put into sleep or you have uh, in the. Hello. Hello, hello. Are we here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the well, the the, the animals are actually actually under light anesthesia. Uh -huh. They have to be. But in that sense, that would that would, would have interfered with uh, the, the measurement, the assessment? Uh, yeah, this is a very good question. Now, the answer, we are actually doing a very extensive study now. Uh, the, the answer at this point is no. Because mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, we actually do the animal under usually using telemetry, which is a conscious, and then in the animal. So about two years ago, we've been successful in, in actually recording the same recording from the animal while they are doing the MRI, and the, the, the results are actually exactly the same. So we can say indirectly that the, the if there is any interference, it is, it is not that important. I see. Thank you so much. How about the vagus nerve that controlling the heart? Uh, uh -huh. I wonder if that have any uh, correlation regarding that um, in the in the in the the receptor end of in the the heart area, the, those tissue, the vagus nerve. So, 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 um, what do I say that? Uh, I I don't. Can you repeat the experiment? I wondering that uh, because we also know that uh, vagus nerve are regulated those uh, um, um, the nerve ending uh, from uh -huh, the uh -huh. yeah. And then I'm wondering that how how um, when you measure in the in the MRI how uh -huh. that break in the 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 vagus uh, sur surprisingly not much. Not much, the, because the MRI says even in a normal MRI, we, we actually have have devices that will monitor the heart rate, monitor respiration, and and then the the, the basic uh, rule in animal MRI is that it has to be within a certain uh, range for for the, the for the for the data to be valid. Yeah, it, it's already there. And then lately, we actually record directly from the animal. Uh, with the same technique that we do with radio telemetry. And it, surprising, everybody thought the heart would be affected. It actually is, is, is the, the least affected. Uh, it is very surprising. The, the heart is very, very, uh, it's a wonderful organ. It, it, it can actually resist a lot of disturbances. I see. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if there are any question in the chat. Uh, Michael, is that any question in the chat? There are currently no questions in the chat. Yeah, I don't see any questions <laughs> in the chat right now. I think you've covered it all, Dr. Chan. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, this, uh, to do a 25 years 
know, to put 25 years into one hour is very difficult, but I, I, I hope I'm not, you know. It's very uh, informative uh, for the student uh, to understand the very complicated assistant. And yeah, uh, I just used, I just used pictures, but you see, nice pictures where it comes in, it, it goes out. And <laughs> Uh, so, what question uh, from Alex Knight? What is the determining factor that allow for an observational differentiation between the nitrosative and an oxidative state? Is the only observational uh, distinction the progression of the disease? Uh, mm, yes and no. The uh, well, the, the the theme of this talk is to to tell you the the differential roles of oxidative stress and nitrosative stress, but certainly they are not the only factors. Uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, brain death, you, you would expect brain de death is such an important phenomenon to the being. Uh, it is a very important, but it's not. But, but I can tell you this, that the, uh, there would be a lot of checkpoints uh, many, many uh, systems that are actually uh, doing check and balance. And uh, when any time when this happens, this is, uh, the balance is always being adjusted by itself in a normal situation. But then the, the only time when the situation is irreversible, that is the time that we're going to the brain death. So before that happens, the body, believe me, is trying very, very hard uh, uh, to, to really revive the animal or the or, or the or the, or the, or the patient, but then the interesting thing is when the life and death signal is gone. In our hands, there has been no exception. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the, the point is, it has to be gone for several hours. If it would, if it's a come and go, it doesn't matter. It it it, it doesn't count. But if it's gone for uh, several hours, then that's the end of the story, and that is very definitive. And that, that is the sad part of this last 25 years. Uh, uh, for the students, I can tell you, uh, I'm also a human being. When we start the study, when, when I first talk about these studies, I cry on the podium uh, because I, I can see the faces of my patients. But it's a but 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 you, somebody has to do it. But but it's uh, but we look at it. If we can know what happens before that, then we we can stop it to go into e e reverse irreversible stage. Then we actually can help people. And this is actually what we're doing now. Yeah. Well, certainly, uh, research is, has to continue on. Uh, hopefully, we can. Shorten that irreversible phases. <laughs> so life can go on instead of go to death. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, any more questions? We are using the chat, so it's a little bit different. So I keep on asking questions. Uh, I'm not seeing additional uh, chat uh, question in the chat. So yeah. um, with this, thank you so much for uh, for you to get up so early, I now is uh, uh, getting seven o'clock in Taiwan now. Uh, thank <laughs> yeah. you so very much, and then well, uh, it, it's, sharing it's with been all a, this. Uh, yeah, it, it's a pleasure, and, and I'm glad I have the situation. Uh, I hope one of these days I can go directly to your place and see you yes, all. Yes, definitely. Person, <laughs> <laughs> and you're all welcome to come and visit my my institute. <laughs> definitely. But it's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it is always it is it is always nice to uh, to be among academic people rather than my administrative people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dr. Tall, uh, go back to you. Thank you, Dr. Chang, and thank you, uh, Professor Chen. Um, you know, it was, it was wonderful to um, to host you, and I guess now you're you deserve a good breakfast uh, for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for your sacrifice of REM sleep, so that you can uh, so you can share your research with us. Twenty five years of work, wow, that's amazing. Um, thank you so much again. Well, it's a pleasure, and I'm very glad to uh, get to know you. And uh, and the best for the remaining part of your program. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, yes. Okay. So I'm gonna sign off now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you.
Okay. Bye. 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 Okay. Okay. So for the last part, I just want to do two things. I just want to acknowledge a few people. Um, take a minute to acknowledge a few people. Um, after Professor Chan. Um, I want to go right away to Mike Supios and Burke Loxley because these are the guys that are making this thing run. I mean, they're they're making sure making sure that the software is doing what it has to do. The proper connections are being made, and in addition to that, they're really knowledgeable. I mean, they really helped me out when it came to how should we set this up, how should we run it when we've got this many people, and here's what we want to do. And um, I can't thank these guys enough. Um, they're they're really good guys to work with. Um, in addition to them, I'll thank Dr. Zhao, Dr. Chang, um, our department secretary, <clears throat> Angie Cook, and lastly, our judges, um, Sylvia Rabaki, Eric Hill, Susan Gantar, and Rafi Manjikian. Um, it was tough. It was it was a challenge to to do so many posters and so many presentations in a, in what for us is a short amount of time when we're judging. So I want to thank you so much for doing that, and to thank all the students um, for participating, for sharing your knowledge with us and and with each other. You know, it was really nice to come in and, and, and go to some posters and I'd see a bunch of people in there, um, you know, listening as well. It just it gave me that feeling that I was hoping to get, um, which was, you know, us coming together and doing this. The last thing I want to mention, and this is just. Um, so we did some judging, we did some scoring, and so we have some results. So I figured I'd share some results with you um, for the omics group. Third place was Lorena Pena. Second place was Sabrina Lopez. First place was Danielle Mara. For the undergrad research, third place was Tatiana Rengifo. Rengifo, sorry. Second place was Karina Hello, and uh, first place was Zachary DeSanza and and the other authors um, on the poster as well, um, Adrian Bernal. And then for the graduate research, third place was Alexis Hernandez. Second place, there was a tie between Brian Rice and Ayuni Yusuf. And first place all by himself for graduate research was Shihu Ma. So congratulations to everybody. Um, if your name wasn't on this list, that's OK. Everybody's a winner. Everybody did really well. And um, you know, being here was you know, just just terrific. I'm glad that I'm glad that everybody participated. So thank you for showing up this year. Um, hope to see many of you next year. Those of you who are not graduating um, might be around for another year or so. Look forward to it. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Bye now. Thank you.